recording and we started. Welcome everybody to this class I'm leading called How to Lead a Seder. And I think that's a little misleading um, in some ways because uh, um, it's not that I'm expecting that nobody here has ever been to a Seder or has any idea about how to lead a Seder, but this year is a little bit different and a lot of us are in the position where we are, um, we're in the position of leading a Seder when we maybe haven't led one in a long time. Maybe we're used to going to family or other, other places where somebody else always leads the Seder. And so now we are in the position of leading a Seder. So I'm just gonna give, uh, I'm gonna cover, I'll tell you what the, the outline is. We're gonna talk first about what is a Seder all about anyway. Number two, what are the really essential parts of a Seder? And number three is how can we get meaning out of the Haggadah this year in particular? And number four is briefly, uh, is it really possible to lead a Seder on Zoom? Which the answer is definitely yes. Uh, and I'm no Zoom expert, but I'll give you a few tips and send you to places where you can learn more. So off we go. Um, and in talking about, let's see here, in talking about leading a Seder, uh, what is the Seder all about anyway is a relevant question. And um, the thing we might think the Seder is about, which people do sometimes say, and there's argument about this in the sources, is about remembering the story of the Exodus from Egypt. And the problem with that being what the Seder is about is that that is actually something we do every day. Every day we are called on to remember the Exodus from Egypt. Here, this is um, the verse for, from uh, the Shema, the third paragraph of the Shema is the rabbis say a reminder to us of the Exodus from Egypt. And so we, we have that. And then of course we have uh, Micha Mocha right before the Amidah. We remember the story of the Exodus from Egypt before we stand up before God. So it's not really about remembering the story. Instead, it's about retelling and re-experiencing the story. And that comes down to us from the Torah itself, that the Torah says, you shall observe this as an institution for all time for you and your descendants. When your children ask, what do you mean by this? You shall say, it is the Passover offering to the Lord. So the idea here is this is in chapter 12 of Exodus, even before we've, um, even before we've left Egypt, when the Israelites are still in Egypt, God says, you're going to have to retell this. You're going to have to actually have a, some ritual where you remember, you retell the story and re-experience it year after year, even prospectively, we're told that. And then in Exodus 13, it says, you shall explain to your child on that day. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I went free from Egypt. And it's expecting that this is going to be hundreds, thousands of years hence when we're talking about our ancestors. And yet the language is, and this is the language we use in the Haggadah, it's because of what God did for me. I went free from Egypt. It wasn't my ancestors. It wasn't somebody else. It was me. I have to experience this myself. So the Seder really is a structured way of retelling and re-experiencing the story. And the Seder is the structure we use to do this. So it's a tool. That's what the Seder is. It's a tool created by the ancient rabbis for us to be able to do this. And we have the source for it. Actually, unlike many things that we do, the source for it goes all the way back to the Torah, because also in Exodus 12, when it's talking about what we're going to do to remember going out of Egypt, it says, it gives us a basic kind of structure of the Seder saying that we're going to eat the Passover offering on that night and eating it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. So that part of the Seder that we do do is right there in the Torah. And then it's even more worked out in the Mishnah. In Mishnah Pesachim, in the 10th chapter, it gives a sort of order of the Seder much the way that we do it today where it says, you know, we have the first cup of wine, you dip greens, you bring matzah and lettuce and haroset, they bring a second cup, this is the place the child asks the questions. A lot of the structure is from ancient times, and that's what we're doing when we create a Seder, is we're using the structure of ancient times to 
help us tell, retell and re-experience the story in our time. So the thing about it is though that within the structure of the Seder, every generation is meant to tell the story in their own way and to re-experience it in our own way. It's not meant to be something that is set, only its outline is set, but what happens within that outline, that's for us to create. Um, so we should feel very free to do that kind of creation and creativity is a really important part of the Seder. So some of that creativity, uh, the creativity can take many, many forms. One of them is by using songs, different songs and tunes. This is one that we used to do with a Seder with friends of ours. If you know the tune of, oh, my darling Clementine, said the father to his children, at the Seder you will dine, you will eat your fill of matzah, you will drink four cups of wine. And then it goes on for about 12 or 15 more stanzas uh, that describes the whole order of the Seder. And I put the, uh, the URL there for people who want to look at it after. I'll send this out afterwards so people can, can check those references if they'd like. Um, so there's a lot of different songs that uh, some funny, some not. There's a lot of tunes that we use at the Seder that come from, you know, hundreds of years ago or tunes that we just adapt from popular culture that are a lot of fun to do. And that's one of the ways we interest people in the Seder. Then we have customs that we use. Uh, customs like, um, for example, there's a custom many people have, uh, have adopted of taking leeks. And during the part of the Seder, when we're um, sometimes during the part where we're dipping things in salt water, sometimes through the Magid section, taking leeks and whacking each other with leeks to remember our oppression in Egypt. So customs like that that are amusing and fun, those are great ways to make the Seder a little bit different. Sometimes the differences that we're gonna use are about food, right? We have a vegetarian household. We don't eat the same foods that were at my grandmother's Seder or my mother's Seder. Um, so we eat different things. One of the reasons I put this particular slide with um, parsley up there is because of karpas. Sometimes people think of karpas as it has to be parsley dipped in salt water, but it can actually be any vegetable dipped in salt water. And we can in fact set out a big spread of, uh, of all sorts of different kinds of vegetables so that we actually get to eat something substantial early on in the Seder. And we're not so hungry that we want to rush through just to get to Shulchan Arech to get to the meal. And then another thing that I really love to do, we do at our Seder is to, to act it out, to act out the story um, in the Magid section, you can act out other parts of the Seder as well. Um, there are plays and skits that are on the internet or in some Haggadot. I have some that I, I've written, we, we used with my family. And it's just a really great way to involve people. And whether people you want to want to just give people characters and have them go with it, or write out a full script and have people each take a part, it makes people get involved in a way that otherwise people can sit back and distance themselves. This makes them get involved and have some stake in what's going on. And then there's the age range. We know that since the Torah is commanding, uh, the Torah is commanding us to, um, to tell this to every generation that we're supposed to be involving uh, all sorts of folks. We're supposed to be involving people from young to old. And in particular, it's not just about involving young to old, it's about who is at your Seder. And if you're leading a Seder, that's one of the biggest things you have to concentrate on is who's there? Who is going to need to be engaged? So what's the way to do that? Um, and you can't assume that the way you would be engaged at a Seder is the way the people at your Seder are going to be engaged. So some people uh, are engaged by discussion and argument, comparing sources. I've been at Sederim where each person actually has a different Haggadah and we compare and contrast what's in the different Haggadot. Some people are engaged by the tradition of choral reading, of all reading together a section in English or in Hebrew of the Haggadah. 
Um, some people are engaged by, as I said, plays or skits or songs. Uh, those things are all different ways of engaging people, but you need to, it needs to be content that's appropriate for who's at your Seder. Um, and that's, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute as well, but the other thing you have to think about is length. The length also, there's no one length prescribed in the Mishnah or the Torah or the Talmud. We, the length that we have is, is, uh, of our Seder has to be dependent on who is there and what, what are they going to uh, engage, what are they going to be engaged in? So we have to, we have to take that into account, basically. I, I've told several times a story uh, about when our oldest was about uh, one and a half years old, and we had a Seder, I held a Seder for all the kids in the neighborhood who were all his age or younger, and we did every step of the Seder, uh, and the whole thing took about 20 minutes because that was their attention span. And that can work great. That can actually be a really great and engaging Seder. Um, you just have to know your audience and pay some attention to that. And the underlying all of this, of course, is where the whole reason we're having this class is you need to prepare. You can't go into it blind or hoping the, the Haggadah is just going to lead you. You need to prepare and think about how are you going to handle all these different parts of the Seder. So speaking of the different parts of the Seder, and I know I'm going fast, but we'll come back for questions later on. What are the really essential parts of a Seder is a question I do get asked, and I am going to answer right now. The Seder has its own outline. We have the outline, these 14 steps of the Seder. People often sing them. We certainly do in my family. Kadesh um, Rochatz, Karpas, Yachatz, Magid, Rochza, Motzi Matza, Maror, Korech, Shulchan, Orech, now, the, and the fact that they rhyme in couplets, I don't think is uh, accidental that these ended up being the names of the steps of the Seder. So that outline is the thing. And as I said, you can do that whole outline in 20 minutes if you want to, or you can do that whole outline in hours and hours if you want to. Um, and what most people do, much like the, the stops of the Israelites in their way through the wilderness, weren't even some places they stopped for a few weeks, sometimes they stopped for two years. That's the way it is in the Seder too. Sometimes some steps of the Seder you can blow through really quick. Other times you wanna slow down and really talk about and have some activity that's part of that part of the Seder. And we all know that's true about the Magid section, step five, which is the longest typically part of the Seder, but it can be true for other parts too. Um, you might wanna slow down at uh, this year at Rochza, at the washing of hands. There's other times you might wanna slow down and, and do an activity or tell a story or something like that at a particular part of the Seder, whereas other parts you might go through really quickly. And you might do that differently on different nights as well. All right, so in thinking about the, these steps and how we might do them, I came up with um, this outline that tries to draw out themes from different parts of the Seder so that we can think about how we might uh, integrate activities or uh, different kinds of songs or skits into those parts of the Seder. Um, and one way to engage people, which is why I created this outline myself, is to hand these out to different family members to say, okay, everybody, um, you're gonna have Kadesh, and here's the themes, and bring something, think about something. Bring a poem or a reading or a memory or a story from your own life that's going to address this part of the Seder. So, and that's actually been pretty successful. It makes people take ownership of the, the Seder. It's not my idea. I think Ron Wolfson maybe is the person who came up with it, or maybe it's from ancient times. Who knows? But uh, it does work. So, when we're talking about, let's go through them pretty quickly. Um, Kadesh, which is the first step of the Seder that involves lighting candles and saying the blessing over the first cup of wine, you can use themes like light and blessing, resting, having gratitude. Gratitude shows up a lot in the different steps of the Seder, as so much of it is really about thankfulness. Number two is Urchatz, washing the hands without a blessing. It's themes about water, purity, the Nile, the Sea of Reeds, these things that figure in the Pesach story, and of course, spring with the rushing water, the melting of the snow. Step three, the karpas, eating a vegetable with salt water. Um, and this has themes about the environment, about the new growth of spring, 
Uh, climate change has been really raised a lot in Federim I've been to around Karpas. Of course, the tears of slavery with the salt water, as well as the hope for freedom, as some people say, the combination of something something tasty with the salt water actually gives you hope that freedom is going to come. Number four, Yachatz, breaking the middle matzah, has themes about hunger, about brokenness, about homelessness. This is the part where we raise up the matzah and say, let all who are hungry come and eat. And this year in particular is not a time when we're going to be inviting people we don't know to come in and eat with us at the Seder, but it is a time for us to think about how do we do that in our lives? How do we make sure that's a focus of our lives throughout the year. Number five, the Magid section, telling the Passover story, of course, has these themes about slavery and freedom, passing things down throughout the generations, um, refugees, since the Israelites were in fact refugees and strangers in the lands that they passed through. Um, of course, about power and authority of Pharaoh, about immigration, about the experience of persecution that Jews have gone through from that time to our own and that many other peoples have gone through as well. All those things can go into telling the Passover story. Step six, rochza, washing the hands this time with a blessing in preparation for eating. Um, that brings themes of abundance and the opposite of food insecurity, which some people in our community, in our communities are experiencing now that they haven't um, that they haven't experienced before, simply because it's not so easy to get our hands on food as we're used to that idea of just going to the store and that's more complicated than it used to be. And of course, purity and again, gratitude for washing the hands. And yes, I am going to be sending out the PowerPoint. So don't worry, you don't have to take notes real fast. Uh, number seven, motzi matzah. It's a, there's a slash there because we say, say two blessings. We say two brachot one the hamotzi blessing and one a special blessing for eating matzah. And that's why we do need matzah for the Seder, but we don't need it the rest of Pesach. We just need to avoid chametz. So this blessing brings us themes of really trying to experience slavery, poverty, since matzah is said to be the bread of poverty, the bread of the lechem oni, uh, the experience of hunger, since it sometimes takes a long time to get to the step of the Seder and the experience of, again, gratitude for having something to put in our mouths. Step eight, maror, eating something bitter, uh, brings the themes of, again, experiencing with our bodies what it is like to be in slavery and instilling at us, in us or inculcating in ourselves a sensitivity to the suffering of others. Number nine, korech, was combining the matzah and the maror and the charoset into a sandwich. This is the practice um, that we're told is the practice of Hillel. This is about combining sweetness and bitterness, combining the suffering of our people with hope for freedom and the future, and also connecting to the ritual as it's described in the Torah and also in the Mishnah and the Talmud. So we have this feeling that we're doing something that people have been doing in much the same way for hundreds and hundreds of years. Step 10, Shulchan Arech, eating the meal. This can bring themes of gratitude, of hunger, of welcoming people to eat together. Um, I always thought this was going to be a step of the Seder that nobody wanted to take on, but I actually found that a lot of people were interested in uh, reflecting on the meaning of eating uh, and eating together, maybe especially this year when we're, a lot of us are going to be, have Sederim where we're eating not with all the people who are, not physically with all the people who are at the Seder remotely with us. Um, what does it mean to be eating and sharing that experience when we're separated? Step number 11, after the meal is eaten, safun, searching for and eating the afikomen. Uh, this brings themes of what is lost and what is found in our journeys. How do we create community by all eating a piece of the afikomen and an acknowledgement that the journey from uh, slavery to freedom is really not completed, not for us personally, not for the Jewish people as a whole, and not for the world. Step 12, Barech, blessing after the meal, gets us to focus a little bit uh, in, in the traditional Birkat Amazon or in other blessings that we might say for this step of the Seder uh, to reflect about how much we depend on other people um, for the food that we have. And again, maybe this year we'll more more aware of that than in other years, that it's not, this food did not come from us. It was the efforts of a lot of people doing a lot of work for other people that allows us to have this food to eat. 
And finishing up the Seder, we have number 13, the Hallel, the Songs of Praise, uh, which brings themes about song and prayer, um, history, the connections between our history and our present, and again, relying on something outside of ourselves to get us through a hard passage and a hard time. And finally, the final step of the Seder, for number 14, Nirza, uh, the concluding blessing brings these themes. And again, this is a step of the Seder that often gets a little bit of short shrift at the end, but this has been one of the most powerful at the Seder room I've been at because we think about what are our hopes for the future, especially in the moment that we're in. What, when we're reflecting on what we've learned at the Seder, how does that make us think differently about our goals for the coming year? And, you know, we end the Seder with the phrase next year in Jerusalem and over the centuries of people doing Sederim in situations where they had no possibility of hopping on a plane and going to Yerushalayim. What did that phrase mean to them? What does it actually mean to us? We may, maybe physically, we think we're going to be in Yerushalayim next year, but for a lot of us, it's about a, a hope for a kind of maybe an elevated state or a transformation in ourselves. What, what is that hope? What are we holding as we come to the end of the Seder? So these are all great themes to think about in terms of uh, our own preparation and in terms of maybe stimulating others to prepare parts of the Seder. Um, and uh, we also need to be creative, right? There's a lot of different ways to handle the Seder. As I said, some people want to be have, uh, have deep discussion about a current topic. Some really want to hear all the words, uh, the traditional words of the Seder, but everybody appreciates creativity. Uh, and it, especially this year, we might be creative with say some of the washing, using hand sanitizer, if any of us have hand sanitizer, um, is one way to just do something a little different for part of the Seder. Um, for the four questions, there's some wonderful uh, silly poetic versions of the four questions like this one um, that we can use in addition to or to supplement or to either supplement or replace the traditional questions because it's supposed to be a night of questions that we're, that we're all asking and trying to answer questions together. And we also might think of different ways, you know, speaking of ways to maybe speed through some parts of the Seder in order to spend more time on others. Um, you know, things like do, for Barech, which Birkat Amazon for some people is extremely long and for some people extremely unfamiliar, often doing a shorter prayer like this, like Brich um, this prayer popularized by uh, Shefa Gold and how she, the, with the tune that she wrote for it, which you can find on Bandcamp, uh, is a way to ease us through a part of the Seder as to get to something we might want to spend more time on. Okay, so what, how could we, in particular in this year, get more meeting out of the Haggadah in this year of coronavirus? I really, I, I really don't like that image, but it is the image that we are in. So our current circumstances really do prompt us to interpret things from the Haggadah differently than we might otherwise do. Um, we often really are looking at the Seder from the, uh, sitting at the Seder from the standpoint of, ah, we are most of us in a good place. Well, we, we are free from the kinds of, um, of fears and the kinds of anxieties that we imagine in our ancestors when they were in slavery in Egypt. Um, and, and we're looking at it a little bit from a remove. This year is, as I've said before, an experience we never would have sought um, to really empathize with the experience of the slaves and relate to some of the parts of the Seder in a different way than we normally do. So certainly the washing, the fact that washing is a big part of the Seder, many people have already mentioned is uh, really kicks on new meaning for us. And, uh, you know, the traditional washing is a washing just with water. We might supplement that. Um, some have suggested that we might, uh, instead of singing happy birthday twice, sing Dainu while washing, um, because that's another way to make sure we're washing for 20 seconds and, and yes, use soap. Um, but washing that's become so much a part of our everyday lives in these days is really feels different uh, this year. It, does, it feels a little bit less ritual and a little bit more practical than it did other years. 
the feeling of brokenness. Um, you know, the Seder is usually a happy time, but it's also a time to feel uh, empathy for the people in our world who, and who see its brokenness maybe more than we always do. This is a year for us to really think about the brokenness of our world. At, at Yachatz, when we break the middle matzah, there's a lot of brokenness out there. There's a lot of people who are very worried about people who are ill. There's a lot of people suffering. There's a lot of people suffering because they can't, in a time of grief, um, be with their loved ones, um, can't have the comfort of hugs and co-presence that we usually is our, our, the, our practice around grief. So getting in touch with that brokenness during the Seder, I think is a really uh, powerful way for us to experience um, not only what things were like for slaves in ancient times, but what things are like for so many people now. The plagues. We have, there's been a tendency in modern times and contemporary times to, um, to make light of the plagues. And I understand that because of taking the plague seriously is a little bit horrific uh, to think about those things actually happening. But this year is a year where we can really relate to a plague and particular to those plagues that are about disease. And some of the plagues are about disease among animals or among humans. And uh, it gives us a little bit more empathy for the Egyptians than we usually have. I think that the, the Seder is not set up to draw our sympathies or our empathy toward the Egyptian people. And maybe we should think about that some more because now we're experiencing what it's like to have disease strike us, uh, what it's like to be isolated, what's it like to have something strike us without warning and affect thousands and thousands of people. Um, this is a, a year for feeling the empathy with the experience of the plagues more than we might have any other year. Expressing gratitude for our food is really something in a time when it's, we can't just easily go to the store without worry and buy all the food we might want to have and have all the items we might want to have. Um, a lot of us are going to be going into Pesach without a bunch of the foods we have as our custom to eat, whether that's you know special foods for the Seder or for the holiday, or um, you know a different level of kashrut or a different kashrut practice than we're used to observing during Pesach. And so there's loss in that, and there's also an opportunity for us to cultivate gratitude for what we do have, because we're, we are lucky to have all the things that we have. And remembering previous generations of our people who at times uh, very, very difficult times, have celebrated Pesach with almost nothing. Um, we, we can feel gratitude even though what we have is not the same as what we might have had in previous years. The bitterness of the maror, the bitter herbs, the bitterness of slavery that we're asked to re-experience at the Seder is something that's really real for us, a lot of us this year, um, something that it gives us the opportunity to feel it. And I think a lot of the things that we're doing in our lives right now are helping us to not feel it, which we need. We need to be able to go about our lives and to uh, do the things we need to do to take care of ourselves, to take care of our families, to take care of our work. Um, and it, we can't really take a lot of time often to really feel all the feelings that we're having as we see the horrific news around us, as we feel the bitterness in people's lives from this illness and even death. And so the Seder really can be a time for us to share that and to open that up for each other. We need each other's support in, when we're in this kind of a state. And so being able to express how we're feeling about the state of the world is something that the Seder can really help us with. And finally, not finally, but the final thing I was going to raise right now was, um, you know, this paradox of the Seder that usually at the Seder, we say um, two opposite things. We say, um, now, once we were slaves, avadim hayinu, and now we are free, ata uh, And we also say, now we are slaves, ata avde, next year, shana haba chorin. Then maybe we'll be free. And while sometimes we feel more strongly the first part of it, that we were slaves and now we feel free, this year maybe we feel more empathy with and more of a feeling of slavery, of what it's like to be stuck in your house, um, to be limited in what we can do, how we can reach out, 
and what we can experience. Um, I was talking to the religious school doing Tefila this week, and they were, I was asking them if they were having any experiences that were like experience of sla experiences of slavery. And they talked about their feeling of being trapped, trapped in their houses, their feeling of being, of being powerless. Um, they usually they have so much more autonomy, even uh, preteens have more autonomy than what they have right now when they're literally with their parents all the time. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can really empathize with the experience of slavery that, you know, the, the whole um, ethos of the, of the Seder is that is good for us. It is good for us as a people to say, we, we know what it's like to be slaves. We actually feel the feelings of slaves because that's the empathy that we need in order to push us to act in the world such, in such ways that we can try to relieve those feelings in other people not only in ourselves. So at the Seder, we really need to engage other people. Um, we might have our own feelings about how the Seder should go or how we want it to go, but we, we do the Seder with other people, whether remotely or uh, with a, a few people in our own households, because we want to hear what they have to say. We want to engage with them. So engaging with people is maybe the most important part of the Seder. And maybe this year, more than any other year, if we're able to engage with people inside our own households or if we're engaging with people remotely through Zoom or some other means, we really need to hear from each other. We need, really need to be there from each other, not just to read from the book, but to hear how we're feeling, how other people are feeling, how they see this story and our past in light of our present. That's always what the Seder is about, but at any time when we're feeling really isolated from each other, it's more important this year, I think, than ever. So what are the different ways that you can engage people? Oops, so it went too fast. I have to remember where my slides are. So there's a lot of different ways to engage people, and I'm just going to run through some of them. Some of them are very traditional, like having people going around and having different people read different sections of the Haggadah. That's an extremely traditional way, and it does involve people, at least we hear other people's voices. There's also other ways, and ways a little more impromptu ways of involving other people. Um, one of the examples um, that I, is in a, a Haggadah we often used when our kids were small, they had a thing called the Seder Go Round which I really loved, and it asks uh, a question and gives each person at the Seder time to answer that question. And uh, it really lets you hear every person's voice. And it's not necessarily true that everybody is going to, um, is going to answer. Maybe some people will refuse to answer some of the questions, but it is, uh, it's a useful tool to get people to react a little bit. The third one is something I already mentioned, is to assign parts or ask people to volunteer to lead some step of the Seder um, and to say something about what it means to them, uh, to bring a reading or a song or a poem that uh, speaks to them about that part of the Seder. And you don't have to be really knowledgeable about the Seder in order to do that. If you give people the themes, people can figure something out. I've done this very often with people who are not Jewish and they come up with wonderful things that, uh, that really add to and enrich our Seder. Another way to engage people is to have discussion, is to open up some topic that's connected to the Exodus story and discuss it. And this is really engaging for some people and examples that we've done at our Seders in past years include refugees, of course, um, poverty, uh, present day slavery, and we know that their slavery unfortunately still does exist in our world. Um, economic stratification or hierarchy, the divide between rich and poor in our world that we see in the story of the Exodus and in our own lives. And maybe especially this year, disease and healing. Uh, how does that happen and what are the both the physical and spiritual aspects of that that we see in the or we see in the Pesach story or that are brought up for us by reading the story together. Another way to involve people and engage people is to create a story together. 
Um, you can do this by having each person say a sentence and build a story together, whether it's the story of the Exodus from Egypt or some other story, um, or even have people each contribute a word. They have to be careful with that one. That can go off the rails quickly if you have um, preteen children in particular. Some people have a custom of doing art together at the Seder that uh, like an art, a joint art project that might bring you together and a way for people to sort of non-verbally contribute to the Seder. Uh, an example might be, for example, to have blue paper and have people out of that blue paper create something that you could bring together and create um, the Sea of Reeds through which people could then walk as part of the Magi part of the Seder. And then another part, uh, another way of doing it is to, as I mentioned before, to have a play or a skit um, that you perform. Again, people can be assigned characters and you can improv based on the story, or you can use a, a scripted play. And again, there are some online, or I have some, um, that uh, involves people. And, you know, again, for people who say, well, I can't come up with something on my own, pretty much uh, most people at the Seder can read from a script and, and take a part. I'll just say that at the plays we do, for some reason, everybody wants to have the part of God. I don't know why that is, but God is a very popular role. All right, so we're gonna move on now to the Zoom question uh, because I, I saw that, that question in the chat. Uh, as well as um, that question came up before we even started. So is it possible to do a Zoom Seder? Of course it's possible to lead a Seder on Zoom. And I'm not gonna give a whole seminar on how to use Zoom. There are many of those out there on the web, but, um, and certainly the Zoom, at the Zoom website, they have some really great training videos and uh, a knowledge base to help you ask, answer questions. But I'm just gonna ch share a few, um, a few tips. The first is that to use the technology I'm using right now of sharing your screen, you can use this share screen in order to, um, to keep everybody literally on the same page because they're all watching it. They don't have to be looking down at a Haggadah. And you can use this for your Haggadah um, by using some of these online Haggadot that are available. Some of them like Haggadot.com allows you to create your own Haggadah out of the all sorts of amazing parts that they have that include both the traditional parts of the Seder, but also, um, also poetry and artwork and all sorts of things. Jewishfreeware.org, um, that's a site that has some full Haggadot, a full traditional Haggadah, also a sort of minimalist kids Haggadah that are PDFs that you can download and just share in, on your screen pjlibrary.org has a Haggadah for kids, for young kids, that is really great, um, that you can, you, I think you give them your email and they'll send it to you as a PDF, so you can um, download that and, and use it. And kveller.com has a similar thing. Um, and the Velveteen Rabbi also has a nice Haggadah that uh, is available as a PDF that you can download and use. Um, I've also heard for those who are interested in the Reconstructionist Haggadah that uh, I think next week sometime they're gonna make that available. So I didn't have a link for that yet, but they're gonna make that available on their website as well, the Reconstructionist Haggadah as a PDF for people to download. Um, if you're doing a Zoom Seder as a large group or even a somewhat small group, if you have a group larger than five or six, it's really useful to keep people on mute most of the time, just like I'm keeping you all on mute, um, because otherwise crosstalk is really hard. Um, and people, the way Zoom is created, Zoom was made to have one speaker speak at a time. And so if you have multiple people speaking, then the system's just always trying to figure out who am I supposed to be muting and who am I supposed to be amplifying so that everybody hears. So if you mute people and, or ask people to mute themselves and then you can call on people, um, people can raise their hands physically like this or there's uh, a raise hand feature on Zoom um, and one person then can speak at a time, which of course mostly is what we want is for people, one person to speak at a time. Um, and you can use, as we used on this call, you can use the chat function as a way for people to 
have those side conversations or offer to read a part uh, or contribute something to the Seder, to give feedback to the leader about what they're doing. You can use chat privately and you can use chat that goes to everyone on, on the call, um, but that's a really useful function. One thing about Zoom that maybe people have already heard is that Zoom, it's not really possible to sing together on Zoom in a very effective or melodic way because there's a delay. Um, you can recite some things together, but uh, if you want it to sound good, it's not gonna sound real great. Um, but you can, of course, have one person singing, everybody else muted, but singing themselves in their places. And especially if you have different groups of people who are connecting over a Zoom together, that can be really effective because you can hear the voice of the person who's leading and you can sing along with it. And that creates a really nice feeling. So these are the, these are the functions I was talking about using mute, using chat, uh, sharing leadership. Just because one person is the host of the Zoom meeting does not mean that person has to be talking the whole time the way I am right now. You can go around and let people share the leadership. Um, there's a function on Zoom called um, uh, co-host where you can app appoint somebody else to be a co-host who can help share the leadership, help with muting and unmuting. Uh, and uh, that's a really useful thing. And if you want to learn more about Zoom, because um, if you're new to Zoom, that this did not really take you there, um, I would go to their support pages. They have some really great tutorials, and I put the link here, that you can use to bring yourself up to speed. And the good news is I am no expert on Zoom. I, all that I know I learned in the last two weeks. Um, you can learn it too. It's, uh, it's made to be um, user-friendly, and it is actually pretty user-friendly. User um, so I want to encourage people to use that as a resource because it's a good one. And Zoom, you know, you can get a free um, Zoom account that'll last for about 40 minutes. And you can then, if you want, um, just start another meeting for the other 40 minutes. You could do 40 minutes before the meal and then stop, do Shulchan Arech, and then have another 40-minute meeting after the meal for the parts of the Seder after the meal. Or you can get a, uh, um, you can get a paid membership uh, in Zoom, a paid account, which isn't very expensive, it's about $15 a month, um, and that can help you. And the thing about Zoom, it's not that I work for Zoom or anything, but in terms of things that you can use to uh, share um, a video and audio experience together, it's a really powerful medium that is, has more features to help you out than, say, Skype or uh, Google Hangouts or other kinds of video conferencing stuff. Though those can be good too if people can manage to uh, figure out how to use them in a way that everybody's not talking at once. All right, coming to the end here of my preparation, prepared presentation uh, is the idea of having a Zissen Pesach. I am not such, I'm not a Yiddish speaker at all, but I love the expression Zissen Pesach because it's about sweetness. And there can be something sweet about Pesach, even if we are not where we thought we would be, we're not with the people we thought we would be with. Um, there's something about engaging with this story and doing it in the way that we think is gonna work for us and for the people around us. It can be really powerful and really sweet. And so I wanna urge everybody to use these tools. Um, we're gonna have some time in just a minute to share a little bit and have people ask questions or offer answers. Um, but I, I really want to say this is, um, this is an opportunity. It's going to be a different kind of Pesach than any of us have ever had. We'll remember it, and hopefully it will be sweet in our mouths as we hope every Pesach and every holiday will be. So with that, I am going to, <clears throat> I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to ask if anybody has a question or a comment that they raise their hand and I see right now, Jake. Uh, there you are. Hi everyone. That was fantastic, Adam. Thank you so much for putting that together. And if everybody went like this, you could hear the clapping. And I'm pointing that out because we just had a 40th birthday party for my daughter and I played music as a host and I muted everybody, and you could see everybody standing in the background dancing. And it was delightful just to see people physically active, 
to the beat of the music. And that was the best we could do in terms of singing along. And I'm proposing to use that as part of our Seder as well, that if you clap or if you sway your head to the beat or anything like that, there is some unity of all the gallery uh, as an option instead of the cacophony of actual voices. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Jake. Um, um, Addy had asked me to uh, talk a little bit about the structure of Magid. And yeah, the, the Magid in the traditional Haggadah is, um, is a little complex. Uh, it has a lot of Midrash in it. Um, it doesn't really tell the story very much because it assumes everybody really knows the story. So it really tell, uses a lot of Midrashim to remind us of aspects of the story. Um, but it's certainly possible and maybe even desirable, especially if there are younger people in your group, um, to have a way to shorten it and that actually does tell the story. And what I've often done is done some of the, those key parts of, uh, of Magid, like doing the four questions, um, and then in response to the four questions, doing avadim hayinu, just that one little piece of we were slaves and now we're free. And then doing something like a play or a skit or reading a story or acting out a story um, to tell the Passover story. And then singing dayenu uh, as a way of, uh, of closing off the Magid section. So that's a way you could structure it if you wanted to not necessarily go through all steps of the traditional Magid, but at least have you know, those songs that, that frame it a little bit. Um, and then in the middle, put in a telling of the story that can be as long or as short, as creative or as uh, traditional as you want it to be. Looking for other hands, Pesha. So um, I'm trying to figure out, uh, like, do I ask everyone, do I send them a list of ritual foods and items to have available with the understanding that not everybody can have everything? And, um, you know, and sort of like if somebody doesn't have anything they can use for carpus, like what, how can you work that where they feel included? Yeah. I mean, I think it might be fun actually this year to, um, yeah, to ask people uh, who are participating remotely to each have, you know, the different parts of the Seder. And if they don't have something, to make something up. <laughs> In other words, to bring something that they think is a good analog for that part of the thing. I, I'm thinking about, you know, how... Um, all the different uh, things that people use in place of a shank bone, for example. Uh, even people who usually have a shank, I've never had a shank bone in my Seder, but if <laughs> people who usually have a shank bone, uh, this year maybe they can't get a shank bone. We have used things, uh, certainly we've used the traditional beet, the roasted beet, uh, but one year we used a stuffed lamb, <laughs> this little like a beanie baby stuffed lamb. So I just think it will be... It's it always be, Paschal yam. Exactly, the Paschal yam. There can be a lot of, I think, fun ways to, uh, um, a lot of fun ways. I think it just might be fun and funny to see what people come up with as substitutes. And even for people who can't come up with matzah, I, I, I imagine people could come up with a, um, a funny a matzah substitute. What? A piece of cardboard. A piece of cardboard was exactly the thing I was thinking of, but that might be <laughs> a, a great thing, yeah. Other questions and comments? I'm looking for hands here. Uh, there is uh, Hannah. Yeah. Um, I wondered, what do you do when you're going to be the only person at your Seder and your, your, your Skype partner's got a broken camera and is apparently not going to fix it? Um, so is there something we shouldn't be saying on our own or can we can i just go through the haggadah which i would normally do yeah i think there's there's nothing you can't do on your own in in the seder um so all those things can be done alone you might try just doing it over the phone um if you can't set up the the camera idea um but you know even just hearing each other would be something so you'd be able to have a little dialogue with each other 
Uh, but you certainly, you certainly can do the whole thing alone if you need to, and people certainly do. Um, but it might be nice just over the phone to be able to, you know, ask each other the four questions and things like that's that. A, that. That's a good point because I was going to try to teach my cat, and obviously that is not going to work. <laughs> well, the cat might really like Chadgad, yeah. But other than that, it might not be so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Other questions and comments? Uh, let's see, Chava. Uh, so I wanted to make a, a, a suggestion, since I'm sort of at the other end of the age and generational scale, we're not gonna have any kids at our Seder, we're just gonna be the two of us. Um, and I wanted to suggest um, something I've done for Magid um, uh, when, before our grandchild uh, appeared and when I, we used to have mainly adult Sidarim and um, I've had people read the first 12 chapters of Exodus uh, ahead of time and pick a, um, a character and a scene and write a little essay or be prepared to act it out and people have done all kinds of things from you know, a horse dying in the Red Sea to um, <laughs> uh, Nancy's son would always be the fish dying, uh, dying as the waters, uh, uh, and his name was Gefilte Fish, but in any way, on serious ones, we had a friend who always did the burning bush. Um, so um, if you're looking for adult content and not really interested in retelling the whole traditional midrash, another, another interesting way, if you've got people who are prepared to do a little reading in advance, is to, um, is to, is to take, take a character from the story. Great, that's a great idea. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, going down, I, I am looking around, finding, finding, I'm scrolling through, Linda Krieger, there you are, Linda. Hi, I just want to mention that um, one of the techniques that we used for the second Seder that's been very successful and um, can also work with Zoom is we, the second Seder, we would do a backwards Seder. So that the kids who we, you know, we have great nieces and nephews and, um, and grandchildren who could not stay awake to the end of the Seder would have the opportunity to sing the songs that they missed. And then we would start before candle lighting time and then we would um, you know, engage the beginning of the Seder and the parts of the Seder that were important and they'd fall asleep. But it, the backward Seder has been really successful for us. That's great. I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, let's see, Ed, let's see, Ed Lake. Hi, uh, I, I just wanted to say that you mentioned Dayenu and, and at a very appropriate time, but there's also a secular version, low Dayenu, it would not, have, it would not be sufficient. And yeah. that really is, in these times, a very important thing to think about. You know, um, because we're all in, in that Mitzrayim, and uh, if, they, if you don't have the words, I think, you know. Uh -huh. Well, we've used it, we used it when we wrote the folk show, and um, it talks about the insufficiencies that we still need to aspire to. Free the poets. Yeah. yeah. It would, not, it would yeah. not be sufficient. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, moving on, I'm looking. There's Naomi Hirsch. You seem to be unmuted. Now you've muted yourself. You have to unmute yourself. There you Here go. we are. OK. Can everyone hear? Yes. Great. Um, so quick question, um, about you're saying there were 14 steps of the Seder and I had always heard there were 15 corresponding to the steps that the Levites took to get into the sanctuary. And I'm wondering if the discrepancy has to do with Motsi Matzah. And what I was thinking is that they're separate because on Seder night, we make two blessings. We make Motsi um, over matzah, and then we make the special achilat matzah. But I'm sure you have a reason why you said 14, and I wanted to know it. <laughs> um, my reason for saying 14 is simply because that's how they've always been listed in the Haggadot that I have. Um, and uh, also that way they come in pairs, and the song works better. 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, you still sing Motsi Matsa together. Exactly. So, so I think uh, I think that's one of the, one of the very many variations of Jewish tradition is that we can say fourteen or fifteen in the same okay. way in the same way that we say that there are eighteen blessings of the Amidah, but there are actually nineteen. 19. Or one day of a holiday versus two. Exactly. Thank you so much. And the other question I had, someone wrote, you answered in the chat, but I wanted to call it to everyone's attention, and I'm interested what you and others have to say about it. If you have many, many participants in your Seder, it is going to be very hard to um, stop to eat and regroup. I, I think we're going to lose people. So I was just curious if anyone had a good suggestion around that, because um, I'm, I'm leading an institutional Seder and I'm concerned about that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, that's, of course, traditionally a problem. <laughs> is that uh, people drop off after the meal, people fall asleep, people do lots of things after the meal. But I think another alternative other than taking a, a break would be to simply go through. In other words, to, uh, to symbolically eat something and then go through. Um, and that's, that's what we're gonna be doing in the, uh, the Zoom Seder that I'm gonna be leading uh, for our community on, on Erev Pesach, is we're going to get to Shulchan Aruch and then we'll have a symbolic one minute meal and then we will go on with the other parts of the Seder because yeah, getting people to come back is uh, a little too much. I'm trying to find uh, Helen Feinberg because I, I have it on good authority that she was trying to say something, but now I can't find her. Where has she gone, Helen? Oh, Helen, oh, Helen, let's see, hold on a second here. Now there she is. I'm gonna unmute you, Helen. I just, Adam, I just wanted to say thank you so very much for this and every other thing you have been doing throughout this time. I mean, every coffee conversation and every minion and every Torah discussion and just, you know, you're, you have been uh, cheerful and upbeat and calm and it's just making life amazingly better than it might be. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I see some actual hands raised. Uh, I was going to go with um, our president, uh, Denise Wolf. Um, but I can't unmute her. Let me see if I can unmute her. Now I unmuted her. Thank you, Rabbi. I, I too echo what um, Helen has said. Um, I have a logistic question with technology kind of, and, and I'm leading the Seder and we'll have families from different states all zooming in. And my question is, when I'm leading it in my home, I'll have five people in my home, but where should I, where should I place my device? In other words, should the screen be facing our whole family and our Seder table, but then I won't be able to do what you're doing when I'm leading is sort of mute people or call on people, I won't see people. So I'm just trying to figure out, especially those who are hosting larger groups, where should the physical placement of our device be? Hmm. I think it's a really good question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little hard on Zoom, if you're using Zoom, but on any video conferencing to see a large group because the screen is only so big. Um, if you have the ability to like, make your video camera separate from your device, that's wonderful. Most people don't have that. Uh, they're looking at, like I'm looking at my screen right now that has the video camera built into it. Then I think probably you're looking at um, mostly having it close to you. So like you said, so that you can control it and then periodically turning it so that people can see. Maybe even when you have, um, say, other people who are physically with you do something in the Seder, then you could turn it to them and mm -hmm. they would be able to participate in that way and everybody could see them. But I think having it far from you now is really not going to work too well. Uh, even I, I have actually an iPad and I have a wireless mouse. Um, so you can actually put it farther from you and still control it. But if it gets further than about, you know, three or four feet, it's going to be pretty hard to see what I'm doing. So uh, yeah, I think mostly keeping it on the leader and then shifting it side to side might work really well. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Jacob. Um, no, I lost you. Hold on a second. Got it. 
So just on logistics of large groups trying to Zoom together, I, I don't know how to do this, but I know that it can be done because the religious school has, in some of their large group meetings, put people into smaller breakout sessions, which might be a way to, if you're taking a break during the Seder, if you do a first part and then try to eat together, rather than the logistics of everybody trying to talk all at once, you could put people into smaller breakout groups and maybe do like a speed dating thing where you're breaking out different, uh, different groups and letting people catch up with each other. So yeah. yeah, that definitely, I mean, you can definitely pretty easily create big breakout groups. If you have the pro version of zoom, um, then you have the ability to, to create those breakout groups, but it does require each person having their own, um, account. Right. Oh, really? In other words, each person is on their own device. If you have groups of people interacting with groups of people, that's not going to work so well. No. But no. if you have individuals on their own accounts, yeah, you can break people off into little groups so that they could come go break into groups and then come back to the to the full group. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and, and instructions for doing that are on the site. There, it's not really that hard to do. All right, we have a lot of hands, and uh, it's already past four. So let's see, Marlene, I saw her hand up for a uh, long time. Are yeah, we? if you, well, you answered my first question in the chat, but the second one, if you choose gallery view, you can see 15 people on the screen. Yeah, and you can actually even see more than that. You can see, you know, up to, if you, depending on your settings, you can see up to 50 people on the screen. The question is, is just, if each person has their own Zoom account and everybody is remote, then that works pretty well. If you have groups of people who are physically present, then it's a little more difficult. I'm sorry, yes, they don't have to have their own account, just their own device, that's correct. They don't have right. to have their own, but they have to have their own device. So you could conceivably just have a Seder where, <laughs> just funny to me, but it's not so funny that if you have, even if you have five people co-present and you're interacting with five other people who are co-present in their location, you could each just be on your device. Or and, a phone, a cell phone. Right, on, on, you could each be on the phone or on the yeah. computer, or on your, your tablet, and then everybody would be able to see everybody else close up. And that okay. actually, despite how weird that seems, that might actually be a better solution than either only having on the leader or having it far away right. so that it catches the whole group. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Uh, wait, uh, Rivka. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, um, we, we've all uh, gotten used to this, uh, everybody muting themselves or being muted um, to eliminate background noise, but something I've noticed, and I may be the only one sensitive to this, but um, when the device is not on a stable surface and, peep, and it starts moving around in somebody's lap or they're, wa or they're walking with it, I get seasick. Um, and so I would say as a host, one of your instructions to who, however many people are going to be there is not only to expect to mute themselves or unmute themselves, but to make sure their, their device is on, a, on, on something stable. Um, so we don't get nauseous. <laughs> yes, I, I quite agree. I have a lot of experience in the last week of having meetings with teenagers on their phones. And yes, the experience of looking at them as they're going like this and like this and like this. Um, yeah, so having it, uh, ha having it on a stable service, having it propped up, it's the reason that things like tablets and laptops tend to work a little bit better for Zoom than phones um, because people don't often have stands for their phones, but it can work as long as it's, it's propped appropriately. All right, let's see. Uh, Joan Sachs. Oh, I lost you. Hold on, I'm looking for her. There she is. No, there. Joan, are you there? There, I'm here. Good. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm doing a Seder for about 40 people from California to the East Coast. And um, part of that is going to be a children's play. Um, I have... And I have asked almost everybody to bring their computers and to sign up with Zoom, which just about everybody has done. But how do I go through with the kids part, which is a kids play? 
Yeah, I mean, I think if the kids are doing a play and it's, is it written out? Uh, I think so. Um, I am not sure. I'm letting uh, their parents and they organize what they're doing. So I, I believe it is written out from last year. I believe they're repeating something that they did last year. So I think so. Yeah, in that case, there's, there's two options. Number one, it's much more difficult to try to uh, mute and unmute really quickly so that each person's lines are heard. But if it's a small enough group, you can just unmute though, if it's say four or five kids, you could just unmute all four or five of them and have them do the play while everybody else listens. It, you, can, you can have four or five, six people unmuted and it can work as long as they take turns speaking. Um, it's just when you get more than that, that it, it starts to not work. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. I think that, uh, oh, somebody had uh, Rona. I wanted to highlight what Rona said in the chat, which was that you have to be careful if you have a bunch of people in one location with devices that um, you don't get feedback. And that's the reason that I am wearing earbuds right now um, so that there's no feedback into my mic. And so that is an important thing. If people are using their phones and you're right next to each other, it can happen that if they're all just using the phone speaker, they're going to feed back into each other's phones or have a lot of echoes. So it can be really helpful to use earbuds in those cases. Um, and that can work great. And this is a situation I was just talking to Rabbi Richman this morning about how neither of us had ever been able to see the point in wireless earbuds until now. Now it does seem like a really great idea because <laughs> it would be really convenient to be able to have them. So yeah, you want to encourage people as much as they can to use earbuds because it'll It'll cut down on the background noise and make it easier for everybody to hear each other. All right, I'm gonna, we're gonna bring this to a close now and I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, and, uh, and we'll, of course, we can continue to exchange ideas with each other. And uh, thank you very much for the ideas that you've shared. And I hope we all have a Zisim Pesach wherever we are and whoever we're connecting with. And Chag uh, Sameach. Bye-bye, everybody.